Glenn Miller played. Songs that made the hit parade. Return with us to the sights and sounds of Archie Bunker's neighborhood. 30 years ago, the television symbol of living in the American working class. Call Rudy in California. On the phone? No, we just open up the window and holler. <laughs> Here's Archie's house today, the blue one on the right. We took a walk there with Ralph McLaughlin, chief economist for Trulia, a real estate website. Those homes were built for middle class Americans. They were built for teachers. They were built for firefighters. They were built for nurses. And those types of people can't afford those homes anymore. I see a middle class neighborhood that is no longer affordable to the middle class. Kathy Massey moved into Archie's neighborhood 40 years ago. Her husband was a truck driver. She showed us who's buying these houses now. Um, he's a banker. He's a CEO. She says in 1978, her house cost almost $60,000. Today, it's valued at $800,000. And these soaring house prices aren't just in New York. It's happening in job markets across the country. So we wondered about that other TV home, Roseanne's house in Evansville, Indiana. Bye. 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 Quick, they're gone. Change the locks. <laughs> Her house would cost $129,000. But Roseanne's fictional job on TV was in manufacturing. But in Evansville, the number of manufacturing jobs is shrinking. So home ownership in America is, where is it now? Home ownership in America is at a 50-year low. Think about that, Diane. How many things can you think of today are at 50-year lows? So Americans are right that something profound has changed. In the 1970s, a father on one salary could afford the average new home being built then. It was 1,700 square feet, two-thirds had fewer than three bedrooms, more than one bathroom, a luxury. The cost? $191,000. But today, the average new house is $360,000. And the home has grown by 60%, 2,600 square feet, four bedrooms, not to mention multiple bathrooms, as builders keep catering more and more to upscale incomes. I love this town. I love this community. This is Marisha Sevilla. I'm sorry, I didn't expect to get emotional. I can't take my daughter to the dentist. She's one of the people caught in the vicious choice between affording where you live and affording your life. I think I grew up middle class. My parents have four children. They own their home. I didn't imagine I would still be without any idea of how it would get into a house at this point. Her husband is a microbiologist at a lab. They rent a small two-bedroom apartment in California. When we meet her, she's taken on four part-time jobs. Now I do dog walking and house sitting. College savings for the girls? Nothing. Add to it the 25% hike in rent in her town of Burlingame, California. We drop in for tea with neighbors. Teachers can't afford to live here. Blue collar workers, the people that work in this town that we depend on, they have to leave. I've worked in biotech for 20 years. And so you, you have I a... make six figures. And I can't give my kids what I grew up with. Um, Two incomes, you know, it's, um, it's difficult. It's, we can live here, but you know, can we thrive here? So you have to live in a place you can't afford to live to keep the job that you want to keep to. I mean, it's a trap. It says a lot that almost everyone at this table with me a year and a half ago is gone. They had to leave their home. We gathered a panel of experts to help guide us tonight. All of them say they got to live their own American dream. Tamara Drought, the daughter of a steel worker. Being middle class, middle class security, being able to uh, put away some savings, being able to save for retirement. All of those things have gotten so much harder to achieve. Darren Walker, who gives a lot of credit for his success to Head Start. Arthur Brooks grew up in a working class neighborhood in Seattle. 
Dan Gilbert, now at Harvard, but started his academic career at a local community college. Once upon a time, the gap between the rich and the poor was not a large one, and everybody on one side of it had hopes of getting to the other. Two things have happened. One, that gap has become extraordinarily large, and two, the ability to cross it has become extraordinarily rare. You know, it's a game of shoots and ladders that has become all shoots and very few ladders. As for the cost of housing, the experts say it's a lot about political leadership, like changes in the zoning laws. People who are privileged, people who are entrenched interests have made it impossible to build low-income housing, any housing. The solutions are within our reach. The question is, do we have the will to implement? In the meantime, the outward migration is creating a group of Americans called super commuters. There's one light on up there. I wonder if that's his light. It'd be about, is it time yet? We travel to meet Ronnie Thomas, who is just getting up. He's 55 years old, he has a wife and two children, and because he can't afford to live near his work, every day he makes an 80-mile commute. But he also can't afford a car, which means he commutes four hours to work, four hours back, and he's done it for 10 years. Do you ever get up in the morning and think, I just can't go out in the cold and the rain and ride this bike and take this train and take this bus? I do, I do that bus. every morning. That's what, really, this is every morning. Every morning I feel that way, you know? Yeah. But I got, I, but I have, a, I have responsibilities. I have, you know, I have a wife, I have kids, you know, and these are in my driving force. We go with him, first by bike, five miles to the train, then 66 miles by train to the bus. And it takes another 30 minutes by bus until he's dropped at his workplace. Ronnie works at Stanford University, unloading the boxes of food they serve students on campus. The tuition at Stanford is $45,000. And Ronnie, who grew up in a rough neighborhood, says once his dream was to take computer classes, but his long commute makes his dream impossible. So there he is, every morning, walking his bike past the Stanford University students who are just waking up. So when you see all those kids at the university, so many advantages? It doesn't bother me in the least. I'm going to do what Ronnie needs to do. Early bird catches the worms. Hoping the bike, the bus, the train, and those eight hours a day will somehow carry him to a different life for his children. I'm going to come to that sink like I do every morning, look in the mirror, remind myself what your focus is, and keep on trying. Mm -hmm.